Hello, let's move right into Chapter 7 of The Clay Marble by Ming Fong Ho. Chapter 7 The toy village became the center of our world, and Jean Tu and I played with it every day. Each time we would add a few more things, a rice barn, rain barrels, a pigsty, and as Jean Tu shaped them, we would make up more stories about our new lives after we left the border. Hard though we tried to immerse ourselves in this make-believe world, we could sense the growing tension in the real world around us. As we played with our clay dolls, I could not help but notice that more and more heavily armed soldiers were appearing in the camp, trying to recruit men. Sometimes they would stop at our campsite and talk to Saroon. The fighting on the border was growing more intense, they said. The Vietnamese soldiers inside Cambodia were mobilizing their forces for one last attack as part of their dry season offense. So the Khmer Sarai resistance scattered along the border had to recruit more men to counter the Vietnamese attack. But I don't want to fight, Sarun would say quietly. I just want to stay through two or three more distributions to collect enough rice and other supplies. Then I'll take my family home before the monsoons in time to plant the next rice crop. What about his duty to his country? The soldiers would argue in soft, wheedling voices. Didn't he care about the sovereignty of his country? Didn't he want to help kick out the Vietnamese invaders and at the same time keep the ruthless Khmer Rogue army at bay so that there might be peace and prosperity in Cambodia again? I listened to all this while playing with my clay dolls. How could people fight for peace, I wondered. Why couldn't we just go home and grow our rice crops? I didn't care which side won as long as we were allowed to go on with our lives in the village. In our small make-believe world, at least, life was simple and easy to understand. There were no soldiers and no war, only people like ourselves quietly getting on with their lives. And so, as the soldiers tried to talk my brother into becoming a soldier, I made the clay Saroon doll plow his tiny rice fields. Late one morning, shortly after Saroon had returned from the second mass distribution with hoe heads and fish weed and fish nets, we heard the sounds of gunfire and bombing in the distance. At first, I didn't even notice them until John Tu suddenly lifted her head and listened. Nearby, Grandpa Kim had stopped hammering on the stakes of the new lean-to he'd been building and was also listening. What is it? Nia called to him from her thatched shelter. Hush, her grandfather said. I stayed very still and listened too. The sound was so faint that I thought it might be the lunch truck backfiring, but then the dull thuds grew louder and lasted longer. Bombs, Grandpa Kim said quietly. They're shelling the border. It was the quiet, tired way he said it that scared me as if he had known all along it would happen and that he couldn't do anything about it. I looked at my mother, whose eyes were wide with fear. What do we do? Mother asked Grandpa Kim. Start packing, he said, and without another word, he began putting his tools away. So it was really happening. Even on the border, the fighting was going to start again. I watched my mother fold up the sleeping mats and cloths into our ox cart and Saroon loaded up some of the new hoe heads he had just been given. Mother was trying to pile in some kindling as Nia and Grandpa Kim hurried, hurriedly loaded up their ox carts with their belongings. I turned to our miniature village. Two dolls were plowing furrows in the fields, while another mended a fishnet. The latest addition, a baby doll in a hammock strung between the lemon trees, was peacefully asleep. I looked at them for a long moment. I'm not going. I said. Jean Tu reached for a handful of straw and started to cover up the village. Come on, Dara, she said. It's just a toy. We have to go. I'm not going. We could come back to it later, Jean Tu said. She tugged at my sarong gently. Come on. Around us, people were already starting to move. My mother had her arms full of clothes and was yelling at me. Leave those silly dolls right now. Jean Tu and I exchanged a quick look. We could take them, I said. They'd break, Jean Tu said. We can try, I said. I'll carry them. Jean Tu shook her head. Things that can break, she said slowly, are not worth taking. She picked up one of the clay dolls and held it. 
It's only what you can bring inside of you that really matters. How do you think I was able to say goodbye to my mother and father? She asked so softly that she seemed to be talking more to herself than to me. When they died, I stored it up. Everything I remembered about them, loved about them, that's what I bring with me. They're inside me now, part of me. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I shook my head. Think about your own father, Dara. Tell me something about him, something that makes you happy when you think about it. As I tried to think, I heard the sounds of shells exploding like distant thunder. I used to be scared of thunder, I told Jean too. So father would always hold me in his lap and cut my ears with his hands. And suddenly I could feel his hands tight against my ears again, strong and warm, shutting out all the noise so that I was in my own, in our own snug, safe world. I looked at Jean too. I understand now, I said. Gently, I took the doll from her and left it on a bed of straw by the stone beam. Within minutes, we were on the move. Mother and Sarun had stashed whatever they could in the cart. With thousands of other refugees, we headed into Thailand, away from the shelling. I had never seen so many people on the move before. Many of the other refugees had set out on foot, taking nothing but bundles of clothing with them. A few had their belongings strapped to a rusty bicycles, which they wheeled clumsily along. Others had baskets dangling from bamboo shoulder poles, filled with utensils and clothing and even children too young to walk. Swept up by this current, Grandpa Kim drove his ox cart in front, while my mother, with Nia and Sarun, followed in the cart behind him. Jean Tu, Baby, and I lagged farther behind the carts. They had offered to take Baby, but Jean Tu had wanted to hold him. It was eerie, like a dream. Everyone was quiet. Instead of the usual noises of people arguing and laughing and talking, it was now utterly silent. Occasionally, the dull boom of shelling would echo from the distance, but that and the constant scuffling of feet over the dusty road was all I could hear. Somewhere along the way, I lost my sandals. My feet were sore and hot, and I was very thirsty. I wanted to sit down in the shade and rest, but everyone else was moving, and so I plodded along, too, putting one tired foot in front of the other. Once, I heard a child crying, her shrill sobs cutting through the silence, and then I saw her, a thin little girl in a tattered dress clutching a plastic doll by its leg. The doll had only two sockets where the arm should have been, but its long yellow hair swept a semicircle in the dirt as it was swung to and fro. The girl was wailing for her mother, her voice broken and hoarse. Nobody paid any attention to her. I stared at her until Jean Tu pulled me away. Keep walking or you'll end up like her, lost, she said. But nobody's helping her. How is she going to find her mother? She isn't, Jean Tu said. What's going to happen to her then? She'll probably get picked up by some soldiers and locked up in the orphanage they have for refugee kids where they're forced to become slaves or something. Really? If you don't believe me, just start howling for your mother and see where you'll get locked up. Now come on. Shaken, I stumbled after Jean Tu, clutching onto her shirt so that I wouldn't lose her in the crowd. Ahead of us, I caught a glimpse of my own mother and felt reassured. We passed several other children, like the little girl with the doll all of them howling for their parents, all of them bypassed by the hurrying grown-ups. Everywhere, too, there were signs of the temporary homes that people had tried to build for themselves at Nong Chan, a hammock strung between two saplings, a neat ring of stones around a cooking fire, salted fish hung out to dry in the sun, a shelter woven from plastic bags and cardboard, now abandoned and looking forlorn. I thought of the spot we had claimed for ourselves around our ox cart. I had liked the way that our damp sarongs fluttered on the laundry line and that the embers of the cooking fire flickered with its neat circle of stones at night. I liked propping up our dishes to dry on the wooden rack Sarun had made and our palmetto thatched hut, which had become a snug, familiar home for me to curl up in at night. Now it was gone. I thought of the small world of our clay dolls inside. How senseless it was to have cared about something so unreal. We trudged on in the glimmering heat of a blazing afternoon sun. Once in a while, I saw jeeps drive past at the edge of the crowd, with Thai soldiers 
in their olive green uniforms, pointing their guns into the crowd. At first, I thought they were trying to stop the stream of people from moving farther into the Thai territory. But then I noticed that jeeps were driving slowly behind us as well, as if to shepherd us along. When I asked Chum Chu about it, she just shrugged. They want to keep an eye on us, make sure we're not wandering off into their fields. Across the stubbled fields was a cluster of thatched houses, set amid banana trees and bamboo groves. I even caught a glimpse of a little boy driving a flock of geese home. So that was what it meant to be a refugee. We were farmers who had displaced from our old land and yet prevented from settling on any new land. Would we always be on the move? People who not only didn't have a home but weren't allowed to build a new home anywhere? By mid-afternoon, I was very hungry. I had asked Mother to pack some cold rice in a basket, but there hadn't been any leftover from breakfast, and so we had left our campsite without food. John, too, must be hungry, too, I thought. What would the food truck have served today, I wondered? Stew with chunks of yellow squash and strips of pork? Or cabbage and kale seasoned with fish sauce? Certainly there would be steaming hot white rice, and plenty of it. My mouth watered. Just then, as if I had dreamed it into taking shape, I saw the food truck in front of me, parked in the shade of a long thatched building. I blinked. It looked abandoned and therefore strangely neglected, but it was unmistakably the food truck. Look, I said, tugging at John Tu's arm. John Tu glanced at the truck, but kept walking. Wait, can't you see the pots loaded on the truck? Sure, John Tu said, so what? The pots can be filled with rice and stew, yellow squash stew. We can't stop, John Tu said, but she looked more interested. We could take a look, a quick look. There's bound to be some food in there. You could feed baby, come on, it won't take us long. John Tu hesitated. All right, she said. You catch up with your mother and tell her what we're doing. So I ran ahead, ducking between the baskets and bicycle wheels until I caught up with mother. We'll wait for you, she agreed reluctantly, but don't take too long. I promise, I called over my shoulder and ran back to Jean Tu. We climbed over the bamboo fence separating the road from the compound where the food truck was parked and ran in. In the middle of the compound was a large bamboo shed with a thatched roof. I dashed in. It was an enormous kitchen. There was about 50 huge charcoal stoves lining the side walls of woven bamboo strips and another 30 even bigger stoves in the middle. Some of the stoves still had nuggets of glowing charcoal in them. The cooks had obviously left in a hurry. The food truck was backed up right against the ramp next to the front door of the kitchen. It looked as if the pots had been just been loaded onto the truck when the shelling began. John Chu climbed up into the truck itself and I handed baby up to her. She lifted the lid of the first pot in the truck and peered inside. I waited breathlessly. Nothing, she cried. I followed her up to the truck and peered inside the second pot. Nothing there either, except a thin layer of burnt rice. I realized with sharp disappointment that the truck must have been unloading dirty pots when the shelling started. So much for your yellow squash stew, Jean Tu said impatiently. Now we'll have to run back to catch up with the others. Holding her brother firmly against her, she jumped off the tailgate of the truck. And just then, everything exploded. The blast threw me off balance. I crashed into an empty pot, sending it spinning through the air. A shell half landed nearby, ripping apart the thatching of the kitchen roof and setting it on fire. Pieces of thatching collapsed onto the matted bamboo sides of the kitchen underneath. Within seconds, the whole shed was in flames. There were screams everywhere. Outside the compound, people started to stampede. The stream of refugees had turned into a churning, swirling torrent, like a river bursting its banks. People fled in every direction, scattering the running and running into the adjoining fields. The jeeps wove through the confusion, honking uselessly, trying to stem the flow. I groped my way past the rolling pots and jumped off the truck. My one thought was to find mother. And then I saw Jean too. My friend's arms were streaked with blood. She was sobbing, but she seemed unhurt. She was holding onto her baby brother, rocking him jerkily to and fro. I realized that the blood was spurting from the baby, from his plump little foot, which was twisted at a funny angle. 
He's, he's hurt. Help me, he's hurt, John Two said, sobbing. Baby was crying too, howling so hard that his face was turning a purplish blue. I'll get help, I said. Wait for me here. And with the sound of their wails ringing in my ear, I rushed off. And that is the end of chapter seven. We'll pick up with eight tomorrow.